As a daughter of immigrant parents, it was prayer that got us through everything. We prayed even before we went to the grocery store because you never knew how somebody was going to treat you. And so we prayed that God would help us to find the right words to describe what it was that we needed and that no one would say anything that would leave marks on our souls. Look at one another again this evening, like really look at one another. Look at the diversity that we've already mentioned. Keep on looking. We hear from a lot of different organizations like Jubilee USA Network, Bread for the World, the Disciples for the Refugee and Immigra Immigration Ministries, Network Advocates for Justice, ERA, Interfaith Network on, for Drone uh, Warfare, Youth and Justice, Sojourners, the Latin American Working Group, the Episcopal Network, for economic justice, just to name a few. All are interrelated. The young men who came here, prophets of the Lord, we see how God brings youth that are already wired to do justice in today's world. They just came that way. There's a fire in this place. There's so much Fire. We've gathered here this fire today, and this makes this a holy ground. This is a holy ground for it is a particular space where divinity and humanity come together. We are on holy ground for it is the place where categories of people made to be other become neighbors. We are on holy ground for we are attentive to the stories of our neighbors that remind us that we are created in the imago Dei and therefore community. We are on holy ground because it is a border space where neighbor consciousness and God consciousness meet. Let me tell you a quick vignette about what happens when God and neighbor come together. I was invited by a friend to do a Bible study in her church in Chicago. This was a church that was divided between those who were immigrants and those who were not. And there was so much controversy that they never ever dared to speak about the issue among them. I didn't know that and so I suggested to her <laughs> I suggested to her, ignorance is bliss sometimes, I suggested to her, well, I have this great Bible study on immigration, and she said, oh no, you can't do that here. And I said, please, trust me, trust the spirit, we need to speak that here. I did some bibliodrama, and we allowed, we did a lot of praying, because after she told me everything that had been going on in the church, I figured, oh yes, let us pray, I really didn't know what was happening. We did a bibliodrama drama and we allowed the spirit to move and as the spirit began to move in that bibliodrama because in a bibliodrama you begin to enact and to, to take a role in what is taking place and I asked her who are the ones who are most against this and I had them become the immigrants although I didn't tell them that that's what they were doing. <laughs> and as it was taking place one brother got up and said stop Stop! And I said, oh, Jesus, please help us here. <laughs> and my friend gave me this frenetic look. And he came up and he said, I am so sorry. And he went up to each and every one of his brothers and sisters who were immigrants in that place. And he said, hermano, Perdóname, my brother, forgive me. I did not know, I did not realize, and he embraced that person, and he went person by person embracing them. I sat down because when the spirit takes place, you get out of the way. <laughs> And then he invited the others who were a part of his group of this great animosity and they too began to get up and to embrace each other and they began to cry and the spirit moved in such a way. What I didn't know is that her bishop was there as well. You know these storefront churches, they have these weird looking columns in the worst kinds of places and the man decided to sit behind the column. <laughs> and she said to me, oh my God, we are in trouble now. Because you see, 
the bishop had said that we couldn't speak about political issues. But you have to understand that the bishop had been informed by colonized theology in Latin America. You have to understand how those chains were placed on us on the moment that we were saying yes to Jesus. We didn't realize that we were also saying yes to colonization. They came together. And so my brother had not realized that. However, when he was asked to come up and give greetings, he stood there in silence. Now, this is a Pentecostal church. And he stood there in silence. And everybody began to think, wow, the spirit is really moving him. And people are saying, Gloria, Santo, silence. And the brother says, I have a confession to make. And you know where everybody's mind went. However, our brother said, I want to thank the Holy Spirit and all of you because you see, three weeks ago, well, he began with what had happened months ago. He said, I was called by a pastor in Tennessee, a pastor who is alternately documented. You know, we're all documented, right? Okay. They're just alternations. The pastor called and said, I have ice with many vans surrounding the entire building where we are. What shall we do? And this bishop said that his heart just skipped. And he said, be great Pentecostals and have a vigil. Stay there all night praying and praising the Lord, and I will come and call many others to be there. How many are you? And he took count and knew what was needed, and he called all the pastors in the area, some who came from as far as five and six hours away. Everybody came, and they brought food, and they brought blankets, and so forth. But they brought themselves, they brought carloads of people, and there was the church, and there was ICE, and there was the greater church. They surrounded ICE, and they stood there, and they did this to ICE. <laughs> and they stayed there all night in the fire of the Spirit. They surrounded them the same way that Joshua surrounded Jericho. And they walked around and they prayed over them and the one guy who kept going like this to them. <laughs> and as they did that, and the brothers and sisters inside with the many children, finally at 3.30 in the morning, the ice vans began to leave. But they weren't happy with just watching them leave, they followed them. <laughs> Oh, yes, you watch your back. They followed them. They followed them until they were beyond where they could truly return. And that bishop stood there, and he said, and because of that, I then went, I dared to go, listen to this, against the theology, against what my church authorities allow me to do, I went to Washington, D.C. to advocate with a group. You see, what for you seems very natural here, you didn't have the barriers of a theology that told you that you couldn't do that because if you did that, you were being unfaithful. But the spirit informed my brother, the spirit of compassion. We have in, been invited here by the spirit, by the fuego, by the sueño, by the chesed, the compassion of God that stirs in us. And we are ignited to act and incited to speak. We are in a moment of urgency, as has been told to us, because according to the report that was already mentioned, published by the United Nations Refugee Agency, 
War, violence, and persecution have uprooted more children, women, and men around the world than at any other time in the seven-decade history of the UN Refugee Agency. The agency's annual Global Trends study found that, yes, 65.6 million people were forcibly displaced worldwide by the end of 2016, much greater than the population of the United Kingdom and about 300 thousand more than last year. We have to listen to that figure because for me it's unfathomable. 65 million persons. The pace at which people are becoming displaced is on the average of 20 persons every minute or one every three seconds, less than the time that it takes me to speak this. UN High Commissioner for Refugees Filippo Grandi said these figures tell of the need for solidarity and for common purpose in preventing and resolving crises and ensuring together that the world's refugees internally displaced and asylum seekers are properly, properly protected and cared for while solutions are pursued. Amen. Who else is uprooted? Those displaced for economic reasons, victims of natural disasters, our brothers and sisters here from the Virgin Islands and from Puerto Rico, and persons fleeing violent conflict but not subject to discrimination amounting to persecution. This crisis, this need to respond with solidarity, this calling to common purpose is upon the altar for us to consecrate ourselves to the task. Yes, we are on holy ground. A young woman from Morocco of 19 years old who lived in Italy as an immigrant receives a call on her cell phone from a group of people coming on boats from Syria. They are telling her that the boats are beginning to sink. She gives out her number to families, and when they are in distress, they begin to call her. She's a 19-year-old who mobilizes groups of neighbors, networks of people who come at a moment's notice to receive with food, with blankets, and with embraces. Imagine with me for a moment what it means to leave all that you know and to move into uncertainty to let go of vital connections, lifelines, to move away from everything that has given you a sense of identity. I am a second generation person living in this country, considered to me ni de aquí ni de allá. I don't belong there and I don't belong here. And the sense of identity in me is an organic sense of identity. Imagine that you don't have identity, that your roots, your culture, your memories, your family, your property, your history, your language are no longer with you. What immense forces are those that oblige a person to embark on such a sudden journey that will interrupt life and will and which will leave its mark on the psyche and the body for a lifetime and it will extend to the next generations. This radical departure also affects those that are left behind as they grieve and live life without the hopes of the relationships that had been formed. Are we the people? Are we the people responding to this crisis? Are we a people of solidarity connected to this wound in the world? Are we the people? Are we the people for whom compassion awakens our imagination and provokes us to action and words that become? Are we the people who come in the name of the risen Lord? Let me hear you say, yes, we are God's people. Yes, we are God's people. What rights do our brothers and sisters in this situation have? Because you will need to speak to them. The passages in Deuteronomy and Matthew inform us. In the first passage in Deuteronomy, God, God's self, defends the cause of the vulnerable and loves them, thus clothing and providing food for them. In this passage, God becomes for us the example. Listen to the passage. God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. What makes God so great? 
the passage continues, God shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. Then God commands us to also love the alien or the stranger, the herim, coming from the word her, which means one who has no family or land where you are living, who needs or seeks protection from the country that they are in. God then guides us in doing this by giving us the pathway towards it. Yes, we need a pathway because it will mean, listen carefully, that we will have to act against human nature, human nature to hoard for self, to fear the her, the stranger. The pathway is defined thus in the same scripture. Fear the Lord, your God, and serve God. It is out of the reverence for God, focusing on the reverence of the Lord, that we will then see the image of God in our brother and sister, and then the spirit of service will flow in us. And finally, the passage defines our service and entrusts to us the work of defending the weaker sisters and brothers. Cup your hands. Imagine that God deposits into your hand, entrusts to you this work of loving your neighbor, your brothers, and your sisters who are in need in this urgent moment. That is what we call in Spanish, un depósito de fe, a deposit of faith. God is placing God's faith in us. And that is why we are here today. Our faith brings forth God's faith in us as well. Faith is a two-way street. But these verses also lead us to the sources of our own wells for loving. Here is where you find your own wells. You are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. Now listen carefully. Some scholars believe that the book of Deuteronomy was redacted during the time of the Babylonian exile. What a context that is for this passage. For in the exile, Israel had no land and would have found themselves living with those who were not kin. Since the Babylonians would split up the people conquered among the different lands of others that had also been conquered in their empire. What was it like for the Israelites to seek to make their own space as a people who had been violently displaced by war and conquest? Who took them in? Was their hospitality or compassion extended to them? Treat the stranger as your kin, as familia, because you too were strangers. Oh, but then listen up, deep calls unto deep as Jesus himself brings his own echoes to this passage in the, per the pericope in Matthew where he speaks of the final judgment of the nations and the measure to be used for judgment. This measure consists of six mercies, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, Hospitality as shelter to the stranger, adequate clothing to the ones exposed to the elements, healing to the sick, and accompaniment to those isolated as prisoners. These are the same mercies, you know, the scripture is all connected here. These are the same mercies that are lifted up in the passage of Isaiah 58 about how it is that we should fast. These mercies have the power to bust up chains of oppression in order to bring the righteousness of justice. 
Practicing these mercies will bring the light of love and life to the places of inhumanity. It will bring a breakthrough of the glory of God so that the places from which we gave our gardens, our fields, these will be well watered. Our cities where we make room for the strangers so that they can become neighbors to us will be built up and restored. We will then find our joy in the Lord. If we want to see, if we want to see this place restored, it's not by cutting budgets, it's by embracing the stranger. While we persist, while we persist, in our advocacy, persevering in the planning and the policy changing process day in and day out, weary and worn, still we will find the joy of the Lord for it is found in community and solidarity, in the bonds of familia that we form here and with our neighbors for whom we advocate. And then the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. Now, look around at each other again. Who are we? Who are we? We are here as a united group, representing no particular party. We represent the heart of Jesus. We are here to influence the decisions within our political system on the issues of immigration, refugees, and the displacement of persons. We are here to hold some significant conversations, to make a direct approach to legislators on issues which play a significant role in global politics and socioeconomic matters. I see now why it was that the missionary theology kept us from these truths. On the front end of these several days, I'm sure you all looked at your schedules, we are here to learn, to share information, resources, and strength in unity and commonality of purpose, for these are key to the success of the work of advocacy. Pay attention in those workshops. Our work of influence is a process. It does not end here, as has already been mentioned, for we are seeking intervention that will secure the rights of persons made to be invisible to others. That's why we talk about statistics, but visible to God. And that's why we talk about people and stories. Society speaks of our neighbors in categories that mask their humanities. Statistics and labels such as illegal aliens. No one got here in a spaceship. <laughs> Criminals trespassers, inconveniences, our neighbors are branded as political and economic burdens. Let us speak the stories then that will paint faces and lives that bring out the gifts, the resiliency, the life-giving contributions of our neighbors. Let us share facts that will bring focus, new insights for problem solving, and the creation of strategies that address the complexities and help generate designs that many can buy into and feel ownership of. Let me tell you something. I used to think that if you had degrees and positions, that made you smart. But I found out <laughs> that those at times are the knowledge of stupidity. Instead, true knowledge is the knowledge that comes from knowing God. Yada. It's a knowledge of intimacy. From that place, new insights come. And from those places, you must pour out those knowledges of the compassion of God when you speak on Capitol Hill because they are confused. Let us advocate. Let me tell you, I was there once. Okay, now, I, I'm from New York City. I'm a New Yorican, so I tend to be hood. I'm not very diplomatic when I really should be. 
And so I try to be, you know, a little more silent because other people know how to, you know, smooth it over and they make it sound great. And I sit there and I take notes. I go, wow, que bien le quedo, you know? This person really, this person really did this well. And, you know, I try to learn that. But I came into the office of a particular legislative person who was very, very rude to the persons that I was introducing. And I wasn't supposed to say anything, but the rudeness of that person, the hood, just came out in me. I will not say what I told the person, and no, I didn't cuss. But I got his attention enough to really make sure that he sat down and listened. And when he did, he had a real conversation, and he said, but you see, I keep getting these letters. And he told us what was in the letters, and he said, I don't know what to respond. And I looked at my brothers and sisters who were there, and they said, well, this is what you could say. And, you know, my sister who said what it was in her wonderful accent, but he understood it well, what she said just seemed to her like common sense like practical knowledge. And this man sat there like it was the greatest thing he'd ever heard and he sat there, he took notes and told his assistant to make sure that he took notes on that. My friends, the knowledge of compassion is needed on Capitol Hill. Make sure, make sure that you take good note of what it is that you will share. Let us advocate not in our own spirit, but in the spirit of the love of the risen Christ, that we may be powerful in our appeal, that our words, that the full visit would not permit, would not permit the hearts of legislators to become impervious and rigid, that the many pulls of self-interest would wane in light of the forceful clarity of our message, this work of justice my friends, is the true revival. This is it. You want to see revival? Check out the fire that's in here. Check out what happens when you go to Capitol Hill. That is revival. Now, some will say, yeah, but you know, those hearts are really hard up there on Capitol Hill. They're like stone. Well, then let me tell you what water does to stone. <laughs> Weathering is the process whereby rock is dissolved, worn away, or broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. Once the rock has been weakened and broken up by the weathering, it is ready for erosion. Erosion happens when rocks and sediments are picked up and moved away by the currents of water and by wind. We are on holy ground. Each one of us is a drop of water that will rain down on Capitol Hill and will weather the stones, the barriers of injustice with the persisting rainfall of advocacy we will in the name of christ erode the stones we will be united in our resolve as solidarios so that we will be like the currents that are known as white waters that are rapids that will then dislodge and uproot and carry away all that is in the way of the Lord's provisions of love and the winds of the Spirit will be with us. This is holy ground where a revival begins and it is God, the God of the dreams, the God of the fuego who becomes a living reality by way of the advocacy of God's people. Are you representing? Go forth, holy people, to speak words that will open the space for a convictional experience on Capitol Hill. They need to be convicted. Words that will disrupt, that will, oh yes. Words that will disrupt the previous assumptive world of lawmakers puncturing the world views and meaning making of greed. Words that will disclose to the parties who listen visions and dimensions of being nation and global village not previously attended to so that together we can reground and realign our ways of seeing and being community. We are here to help 
alter our nation's ways of being in the world into the ways of the Basilea, the kingdom of God. We are a people on a holy pilgrimage. Let us go forth in the strength of the spirit of the one who is love and is risen and who commands us to love the stranger into neighbor. May God's strength the strength of compassion and love. Every time that there was a miracle, it says, and Jesus had compassion. May we have compassion because we are still a people who can see miracles happen. Go forth and make miracles on Capitol Hill. God bless us.